Hi everyone, my name is Alan Elder and I, uh, I lead the network software engineering team at Metaswitch. Uh, today I want to talk to you about some of the ideas that we have about how we can take the SOI beyond the data center fabric. Next slide please. Um, so Metaswitch isn't as much of a household name as some of the companies here. So I just wanted to start off by introducing who we are and what we do. Um, so we help our customers build highly scalable routing and switching solutions using our modular Layer 2, Layer 3, and MPLS control plane. We've been doing this for a very long time, 20 years or so. We've got code deployed at a lot of customers uh, across a whole range of network segments, from service provider, data center, campus, even SD-WAN. Um, in short, we've got a lot of expertise in the networking space. So what's our involvement with OCP? Um, so we've been involved with the SI since 2015. As you can see from this badly pixelated diagram of last year's topology, um, we demonstrated our protocol stack running on top of Mellanox hardware uh, using the SI implementation. We've also been involved with defining the SI specification, for example, working on the SI tunnel spec with Mellanox again. Now, it's no surprise that the demo topology you can see here from last year and also the same demo topology this year, is a cloth fabric. And that's because the use case that's driving the development of the SI is large-scale data centers. Now, large-scale data center operators are really interested in hardware disaggregation um, because it allows them to create a solution out of best-of-breed components. And by doing that, they, they can produce a lower-cost solution, they have a greater ability to innovate. Uh, and just to illustrate my point, I think actually a slide that Omar's created, which I've, I've borrowed off him, um, is uh, it's a guiding principle that Facebook use. Uh, this is a, a shot from their, their, their recent disaggregate conference, where one of their guiding concepts is disaggregation of hardware and software between the, the data plane and the control plane. But what about outside of large-scale data center providers? Um, there's a couple of cases there. It might be that people want a fully disaggregated solution, so a white box model, where you buy hardware from one vendor and software from another vendor. Uh, but actually, what's probably more common is to have a single vendor solution. Um, but even in those single vendor solutions, disaggregation of hardware can, and software can be really beneficial. Next slide. Um, so certainly, a lot of our customers are really interested in hardware and software disaggregation, even though they have a single vendor model, they want to get the benefits internally of, of disaggregating the hardware and software. Um, for example, the ability to switch out the ASICs or the ability to innovate faster in their software layer. Um, so what does disaggregation typically look like for our customers? Well, what they do is they take our layer two, layer three, and MPLS control plane, and they use that as a best of breed building block to create their NOS. That NOS is then typically uh, separated from the hardware by some form of hardware abstraction layer. Now, the size should really be a natural choice for this hardware abstraction layer. But in our experience, very few vendors are really using it. Um, and, and the question is why. Uh, and we think that the main reason is that the SI has grown out of, out of the data center use case. And therefore, it's got a feature set which is focused on the data center. Um, if we can work together as a community and drive forward the definition of SI, then we can really make the SI more widely applicable and make it used more broadly across the network industry. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to go through a series of network use cases outside of the data center and look at what requirements that places on the data plane and hence what requirements that places on the SI. So for this talk, I'm going to focus on the wide area network. And in particular, I'm going to focus on edge devices in the wide area network. Um, these are devices that provide services like data center interconnect, like mobile backhaul, like backhaul of residential and business traffic. And these are a pretty good target for disaggregation. There's a, there's a lot of them out there. They typically use some form of merchant silicon. Um, and, and people want to innovate there. People want to roll out new features rapidly. Um, so it's, it's just worth briefly mentioning that in the WAN, there are also other requirements beyond functional ones um, that are different to the data center. So things like those different scalability characteristics, things like uh, fault tolerance of network elements, um, 
we're not going to go into those today. I'm going to stick to focusing on the functional differences that impact what the data plane has to support, and therefore what the definition of SI is. Um, I'm also going to limit myself to the case where we use MPLS as a tunneling technology. So there's lots of different tunneling technologies that, that could be used, for example, GRE tunnels or VXLAN tunnels, but we're just going to stick to the case of MPLS today. So if we can go on to the next slide, I'll talk about the, next, the first use case. I want to talk about mobile backhaul. So in mobile backhaul networks, layer three VPNs are commonly used to keep different customers' traffic separate. There's lots of different building blocks that, that work together to provide this service. Um, and I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is go through one by one and slowly build up all the data plane function that we need. So if you look over on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, sorry, as you guys are looking on the right-hand side of the screen, um, I'm going to build up the set of data plane functions that we need over there. Um, so the first element is that there's typically going to be some kind of IGP running. So something like OSPF or, or ISIS. Um, it's going to be distributing IP reachability information. And what the data plane has to support is IP forwarding rules. So put that on our data plane functions, and we'll keep adding to that as we go through the next slides. So for layer three VPNs, the customer traffic is kept separate through the use of VRFs. Uh, now in the data plane, that essentially means multiple separate FIBs, so that each customer's traffic is forward independently of another customer's traffic. Uh, so we'll add VRFs to the list of function, and, and carry on to the next slide, please. So on top of this IP forwarding, we need to add um, the provisioning of MPLS paths. So they, they are the tunnels that connect the edge devices and provide connectivity between them. Now, from a control plane perspective, you can use lots of different technologies here. Uh, you could use something like LDP, maybe RSVP, or probably, probably in the next few years, people are going to want to use segment routing for this. Um, it doesn't matter which one you use from the data plane's perspective. The functionality is pretty much the same. You need to program MPLS paths to forward a packet across the network. And that includes adding rules to pop labels, to push labels, and to swap labels. Uh, just to go into that in, into a little bit more detail, the, the kind of function you need uh, is at the ingress device, you need some kind of tunnel, tunnel initiation rule, so something that's going to push a label onto a packet going through. At transit devices, you need some kind of uh, a tunnel swap rule, which uh, looks at the top label in the stack and forwards the packet on after swapping the label. At the, edge de at the egress devices, you need some kind of tunnel termination rule, so popping off the top label in the stack and then forwarding the packet based on the next header. Um, that's basic MPLS. It gets more complicated. So for example, you could have TTL0 processing. So maybe you want to support functions like uh, OAM, like traceroute in your network. Um, uh, in that case, you need, you need to, be, to be able to pro process TTL0. I won't go into that today. We'll, we'll just stick to the basic set of MPLS things. So next slide, please. So the final piece of the puzzle for layer three VPNs is the use of BGP to distribute the routes for each VRF. So how this works is each route in the VRF is advertised through BGP and assigned a label, which I'll, I'll refer to as a VPN label. So when customer traffic is sent through the layer three VPN, it's encapsulated with a couple of labels. First of all, there's the VPN label, and then on top of that, there's the tunnel label. So the tunnel label defines the path to go from one edge device to the next edge device, and then the VPN label defines the context of which VRF is going to process that packet once you get to the edge device. So what does that mean in terms of the data plane, and therefore in terms of what SI needs to support? Um, so I'm going to refer to that functionality as labeled routes. And there's really two parts to that. Uh, the first part is at ingress, you need to be able to program rules of the form a destination IP address <laughs> mapping to a VPN label to push on, plus the outgoing tunnel interface that you're going to send the packet on. And at egress devices, you need to be able to terminate a packet into a VRF based on the value of the VPN label. So that's, that's the functionality we need to support layer three VPNs. So let's have a look at how that compares to SI. So 
most, uh, most of the vendors you'll see demonstrating Psy implementations will probably be on a, a 0.94 or a 0.96 version of Psy. Uh, and for a long time, that, ver th that version supports IP forwarding and VRFs, and, and that function's been around for quite a long time. Um, the things that are missing are MPLS paths, the label switch paths, and label routes. Now, as Mellanox talked, talked about earlier, as Matty was saying, uh, Mellanox are going to be working on the MPLS proposal, so that's great. We've got, we've got part of the puzzle solved. If we can add the labeled routes as well, then it will really enable a powerful use case, and that's going to help drive the applicability of Psy. Okay, so the next use case I want to talk about is data center interconnect, um, and specifically a data center interconnect using a layer two service, using a layer two VPN. Now, currently, this is probably most likely to be done with a technology such as VPLS or VPWS. But actually, today, I want to talk about a next generation layer two VPN service called Ethernet VPN or EVPN. Uh, EVPN was specifically designed to overcome some of the limitations of VPLS. So it has additional features such as multi homing, as you can see on the, the left side of the diagram here, where I have two provider edge devices on the same site. And that gives you benefits with low balancing and redundancy. Uh, it also has benefits such as Mac mobility. So if a Mac address moves from one customer site to another customer site, EVPN can cope with all of that. So the first building block of this is very similar to layer 3 VPN. Uh, you need IP forwarding. So we can skip through that quickly. Uh, and the next building block is also very similar. You need the same tunnels connecting your edge devices. In this case, we'll talk about MPLS. But it's worth noting that for EVPN, that VXLAN is also another popular tunneling technology here. Next slide. So this is the point where the requirements diverge a bit. Uh, in the case of EVPN, each service or EVPN instance is represented in the data plane by a bridge domain. And it's these bridge domains that keep different customers' traffic separate and forward them independently. Um, the bridge domain is really analogous to the VRF in, in the layer 3 VPN case, but for layer 2 forwarding rather than for layer 3 forwarding. Next slide. So EVPN also uses everyone's favorite protocol, or depending on who you ask, everyone's least favorite protocol, BGP. That comes up every time. Um, the fundamental principle behind EVPN, though, is that it moves Mac learning from the data plane and puts it into the control plane. So instead of the standard source Mac learning rules that everyone may well be familiar with, um, instead it's BGP that does that Mac learning. Um, and that's done by distributing Mac routes through BGP. And each of those routes that you distribute has, a, has an MPLS label associated with it, which I'll call the EVPN label. Um, so when customer traffic is sent through the EVPN service, uh, first of all, you have an EVPN label added, and then you have the tunnel label added on top. Uh, and it, again, it's a bit, bit similar to the layer 3 VPN case. The tunnel label is what defines the path from one edge device to the egress edge device, and the EVPN label is what defines the context of which bridge domain is going to process that packet when it gets to the far end. Uh, so what does the data plane have to do? Well, two things, really. First of all, it has to be able to disable Mac learning because most data planes will do Mac learning by default. Uh, secondly, it has to support what I'm going to call labeled FDB entries. So again, this is in two parts. The first part is at ingress, where you have to support rules of the form, uh, a destination MAC address mapping to an EVPN label to push on, uh, plus a tunnel interface to send the packet out of. And that's in contrast to, to normal FDB rules, where it would just be a destination MAC maps to an outgoing interface. And the second part, uh, is at egress where uh, you have to be able to terminate a packet into the right bridge domain based on the EVPN label. So hopefully everyone can see where I'm going with this now. There, there's a lot of complex requirements on the data plane for, for one use cases outside the data center. Um, and so there's quite a lot of work to do to extend SI. Uh, and for EVPN, there, there's even more complex things still. So if we, if we carry on going through the slides, um, Another bit of functionality you have to have is you have to be able to stop packets coming from the network looping back out to the network. Uh, if, you, if you can't do that, then you create a layer <coughs> two loop in your network, um, and everything's going to melt down. So your data plane has to support split horizon groups. Uh, 
Next slide, thanks. If you're gonna do multi-homing as well, then there's another form of split horizon rule you need. You have to be able to prevent traffic from a multi-home site coming out into the network and looping back to the same multi-home site. Again, if you don't do that, you've got a layer two loop and everything melts down. So in the case of MPLS eVPN, that's done by adding a third label into the label stack called the Ethernet segment label. Uh, and the data plane has to be able, able to perform additional split horizon rules by looking at that Ethernet segment label. So I'm going to stop there for eVPN because I've nearly run out of space on the right-hand side. Um, eVPN has more features, though. You can, you can have things uh, like integrated routing and bridging, where you have a, have a combined layer two and layer three service, um, and that then introduces even more complexity. So this is just the, the first part of eVPN functionality, the kind of the, the 1.0. So how, how does the sign match up to this? Uh, we've already seen the IP forwarding supported. Um, we saw in the presentation from Zinn this morning that in 1.0 there's bridge domains and including with the ability to disable Mac learning. Uh, we've also already seen that Mellanox are going to be pushing forward an MPLS proposal in 2017. So what that leaves is some additional split horizon rules and the ability to do these labeled FDB entries. So with a bit more work, we can really make the site applicable to a really powerful <coughs> use case in EVPN that people really want to see on their devices. Now, I've, I've been guilty of simplifying the last two use cases slightly, because um, I haven't mentioned protection at all. And when you get into the wide area network, protection is really important. Um, it, it's not like a data center where there's lots of ECMP paths, and so you have redundancy built in by the design. Uh, in this case, there's probably no ECMP paths in the wide area network, and so if you want to have a resilient network, you need to put in some kind of protection. There's lots of different ways in which you can do protection, but the most scalable way to do it is to protect the underlying tunnels, the, the tunnels that connect the edge devices. And that's because you can multiplex lots of different services over the same set of tunnels, so you've got fewer objects that you need to protect in total. So if you're going to do protection, the first thing that you need is you have to be able to detect a failure really quickly. Um, you, you, can have, you, you can't do anything if you can't detect the failure quickly. Um, so that's typically done using BFD, bidirectional forwarding detection. Um, and you might think this is a requirement of the software, but if you want to do really fast uh, detection of failures, you need to be sending your BFD packets at about three millisecond intervals. And that just doesn't scale in software. And so most applications will use some form of hardware acceleration to do that. So we'll add hardware-assisted BFD. Next slide, please. Uh, the other part you need for protection is you need to have some form of control plane that's going to calculate backup paths for you. So that could be LDP fast reroute, it could be RSVP fast reroute. If you're using segment routing, it could be something like topology independent LFA. Um, but again, uh, dependent for all those technologies, what you're doing in the data plane is the same. You're pre-calculating a back backup path and installing that in the hardware. And it's really important that it is installed in the hardware because you want to be able to fail over to that backup path as quickly as possible. So with ideally just a single touch with the, with the data plane. OK, next slide. Um, so as we've seen this morning, the, these aren't functions that are currently supported in the SI, but both of them are areas that are going to be worked on in 2017. So this should really help make SI more applicable to one use cases. slide. Okay, so time for me to wrap up. Um, I think disaggregation is good for networking innovation, um, and the SI helps drive uh, hardware and software disaggregation. The concept started in the data center, but SI can actually be useful much more broadly than that across more network segments. Next slide, please. The applicability of SI is currently limited because it doesn't support all the features needed for the use cases in these other networks. Next slide. Um, so if we, can, if we can work as a community and extend the site to meet these use cases, then it can really help drive SI to be more widely applicable. Um, we've got a lot of expertise in networking, especially outside the data center in one environment. We want to bring that expertise and help the community. 
Um, if we can do that, we can enable powerful use cases like I've discussed today, things like layer two VPNs, layer three VPNs, and that can really be the driving force to help take Psi beyond the data center fabric. Uh, and next slide, please. If we can do this, then we can imagine a really simple three-step process to get telco-grade WAN and data center solutions. You can choose your NOS and hardware platform of choice. You take the Metaswitch protocols, and the proposed SI extensions allow you to integrate all that together in a single platform. Next slide, please. So if this is something that you're interested in, then at Metaswitch, we'd love to talk to you a bit more about it. Um, the best place to find us is on the show floor. We've got a booth there in C8. Um, uh, and there we're demonstrating our, our, the, the scalability and performance of our control plane software. <coughs> We've got a, a, a demo running on a SI implementation based on, on some Mellanox hardware. Um, so that's it for me. I'll open up for questions if anyone has any. And thanks for your time. I do have a question. So. Psi, the philosophy behind Psi is to abstract hardware. So when you say, let's extend Psi with new function functionality, the implicit assumption for us and for me is that it will extend in behavior available in silicon. Is this your understanding as well? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, time for a, whoa. We have time for a couple other questions. You can just say it, and then if uh, Alan, if you can repeat it, sure. you know, then oh, he, he's got the. It's function. pretty much a follow-up the previous statement. I really mm -hmm. wonder, as a community, we're going in the right direction. We will basically try to expand SEI, try to follow up the demand for new feature all the time because many aspects of even your use case that you demonstrate, the reality, a mobile backhaul, you got GTP with many implications of the, the reality is far more complex than what you've shown. And many of the use cases for the data center has been limited to the lower layer functionality, forwarding, switching, connectivity. So I'm, I wonder if we should not basically try to use a more flexible model like P4 to generate even the, some kind of abstract interface and so on. So any thought on that? Because fixed function silicone is not the only technology available moving forward. That's, we need to recognize that. Yeah, I think you asked that question kind of, of Aviat also, right? So I think, you know, like I said, that is a, that is a different discussion. I think, you know, I don't want to cut that off here, but, um, Let's have that discussion, and maybe during one of the brainstorming sessions, you know, we talked about earlier we could have this. Uh, that is more of a hey, wither, um, you know. I think it's a good it's a good point to bring up, especially as Alan's bringing up these extra use cases. But I think it's a pretty similar question to what you'd asked last time. So let's let's follow that up in some sort of uh, you know more open brainstorming session. And, there. I mean, I would definitely say that P4 is something we're really interested in as well, and yeah. and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that afterwards if, if you'd like to. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let me say, I have one more question here. Uh, yep, yeah, I didn't mention SDN. I think depending on the, the types of technology, so if you're using something like segment routing, then segment routing really fits into an, SD, uh, an SDN solution. So you could be having MPLS paths based on segment routing, which are provisioned via uh, some centralized controller speaking PCE to your edge points. Uh, in terms of what the data plane is doing, and hence the definition of SI, it's really the same MPLS functionality, but the whole solution is an SDN solution because you're, you're controlling it through the central controller. So it, it absolutely, I think it absolutely is, is applicable, but you're, you're right, I haven't gone into it today. All right, great. Uh, potentially. So please help me uh, thank Alan. Thank you.